You are listening to From Sobriety to Recovery with Jesse Mogul. Let's get to the show. Welcome back to From Sobriety to Recovery. I am your host, Jesse Mogul. I am in addiction recovery. Wonderful episode today. We're going to talk about debt. We're going to talk about our finances and we're talking about money. Why? Because a lot of people don't like to talk about money. It can make people uncomfortable, especially in relationships or in family. Um, If you come from one of those families like I did, where we were told at the dinner table, we don't talk about certain things. We don't talk about money. It was always like a mystery how much dad was making, how much we were spending. Yet there was some whispers going on in the bedroom. And then all of a sudden we were buying generic food (laughs) or selling a house and moving somewhere less expensive. Um, So I really am excited about putting this episode together and discussing finances with you all, as I think it's important that we have an understanding of money in a way that is different than how society seems to be teaching people. And one of the interesting things that I recall very clearly when I was talking to uh, one of my clients uh, now in LA, but formerly in DC, when we started talking about budgeting and his finances and how he was going to do that. And while he had a very good communication with his father, he also was like, you know, a lot of these things I wasn't taught when I was younger that I'm just now discussing with my dad and and with other people. I'm not really accustomed to figuring out a budget and understanding how I should be monitoring my money. And it was in that session that I realized that this is a really great topic that we should be discussing because not many people have been taught the proper ways of really budgeting and managing their money. And especially when we get into addiction, when potentially, I'm not saying this is going across the board here, but a lot of us probably, we're not thinking about 401ks and Roth IRAs and monitoring our credit card spending when we were, you know, at the ATM at three in the morning, pulling out $200 for another eight ball. Uh, Certainly I was not thinking about my rent (laughs) when I was pulling money out of my bank account at three in the morning. Um, If you didn't know this, let me be the first to let you know that any reason you go to an ATM after midnight is a bad reason. (laughs) So so there's a lot of different angles I want to cover on this because I don't just want to discuss it in the way that you could Google it and find things. So let me give you some backstory about my finances. I, I want to be very transparent here and let you know why I have spent years focused on my credit score, focused on my finances, the ebbs and flows of money, because money's going to come and go. You're going to have a lot, and then you're going to have a little, and you're going to have a little bit, and then you're going to have a lot, and then you're going to have a retirement account, and then hopefully that goes well. And there's just going to be a lot of money movement in your life. And for some of us, it may have been a lot of onto the debt side, the negative side of money. And for those of you out there who might have gone to college, gotten yourself a good degree, or gotten into a trade profession um, post-high school, you could be looking at yourself having set up for some level of success. And now that you're sober, you have a new opportunity to look at your finances a different way. I know one of the tribal members um, lives in South Carolina, was very happy about getting a promotion, being able to move himself into sales. Uh, he travels a lot, which keeps him away from the family more than he would you know, prefer, but it also is a, putting them in a situation where they can afford things that previously may have been something that they had to save up for, or they just chose to no longer even desire. Because there's going to be times in your life when you want things, and it's like, do I really want to go 5, 10, 20, 30, quarter million dollars in debt for a house, for a car, for this vacation. And so when we begin to look at money in a different way, less in a scarcity mindset and more of an abundance mindset, and I'm not going to sit here and blow smoke up your ass, y'all. This isn't one of those things where you can just, you know, what's that, uh, that documentary, The Secret, where you can just manifest money by sitting on your ass. Like majority of the time, it's going to take time. It's going to take work. It's going to take effort. It's going to take discipline to really accumulate some kind of wealth that could set you up for retirement or to put a down payment on a home or to be able to buy a new car. Like unless you really have gotten yourself into a six-figure salary, which are not easy to come by in this country, then you're going to be finding yourself in that working class. So I want to give you some backdrop about what I've had to dig myself out of and what I'm currently digging myself out of. And then some of the ways that I've utilized my knowledge about money to get me uh, onto a more forward path. 
more than likely, I'm going to keep this to about 30 minutes, and we're going to break this up into a series, mainly because there's so many different ways that we could discuss money from picking up a side hustle to getting a different job to uh, different ways that you could be saving, different kinds of retirement funds, different kinds of credit cards you could be utilizing to build your credit. There are so many different angles, and I'm not a money manager. I don't have a degree in this stuff. I have street smarts about this. I have hundreds of hours of researching different ways of saving money and spending money and banking money and and stacking paper and all of that jazz. I'm I'm one of those people who checks my bank account regularly, looks at my credit card bills regularly. I keep spreadsheets. I have due dates for balance transfers, the whole deal. I'm very wise about this and I'm 47 going on 48. I certainly wish I would have been doing some of this stuff as, you know, Maybe not 17 because I would think I was working at like a Blimpies then, but certainly, you know, that was karma. Blimpies was in college. Um, so certainly into my 20s, while other people were setting up Roth IRAs and putting in the max five, six grand a year, I was blowing mine on booze and drugs. Really wish I could go back in time and at least say, hey, bro, just $125 a week, just one night of working at the restaurant, put it over here in this thing. And when you're 48, you'll be sitting on like $750,000. So if you're young, this is an opportunity for you to do some research and figure this out. And we're going to cover all of this stuff. And what I like to call, like, we're going to might even bring this in and call it the breaking through finances, our income, our economics. So we might build this as breaking through. And remember, I launched that in December. This was like the breaking through series where we're trying to break through barriers. And I definitely think debt and money and finances are something that we can break through by experiencing things differently. So back in story of me, I got a lot I could cover. In fact, this is the second time I've shot this episode. And I went on this whole thing about all the way my money, all the way back to like 2007. And it just felt a little bit too diluted and not focused. So I'm going to reel it in and I'm just going to start it up from when I got sober. Um, Well, okay, I'll take that back. I'm going to start it up from the day I broke my leg. I broke my leg August 13th, 2016. If you listen to this show regularly, you know that. On the day that I broke my leg, I had roughly $40,000 in the bank account. I was working a serving job in Hollywood, California at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel, roughly making sixty, seventy thousand $70,000 a year pre-tax, doing very well with that job. Love that gig. You know, being a waiter and a bartender in Los Angeles, you can make very good money. I had friends making well into the $125,000 to $175,000 range. I knew women who were bottle women um, at clubs, easily bringing in six figures and then going to LA, or I'm sorry, going to Vegas on the weekend and doing their thing in Vegas, making another $100,000 over the course of a year. So if you were to live in LA or Vegas, making six figures as a bartender, waiter, delivery person of champagne bottles was not difficult. Finding those jobs um, could have been a bit of a challenge, but once you had it, you were pretty good to go. And I had one of those jobs which allowed me, even though my bills were pretty much in around that three to $4,000 a month range, to still stack some paper. And I started stacking paper when I came back from the motorcycle trip where I drained my bank account, took a job at this little uh, restaurant downtown in the U.S. Bank building, did that for a few months, and then I got brought over to the Roosevelt right around Valentine's Day of 2013. And that's when I started to, it took me a little while to get up into the good making of the money there. But once I settled into that job, I really started stacking paper. So by the time I got to 2016, I had pretty much saved up about $40,000 over the previous three and a half years. So break my leg, 40 grand. Sister decides to go into rehab. I send her over a chunk of money to cover her bills, help out in that regard. And then of course my leg's broken and I'm not working for three months. And whether somebody told me that I should have filed for um, disability or not, I didn't. So I'm blazing through my money, just covering my bills and, you know, going to Trader Joe's and spending $700 on, you know, 50 bottles of wine and 100 bottles of vodka and all this beer. Um, if you've ever heard the story on this show of where I put all that booze into my comforter and then I had to sit down on the stairs and hop my butt up and gently pull all the booze up the stairs because I couldn't put any weight on my leg. And so I'm hopping my butt up and then just, I line all of the booze up against the wall and I'm like, oh yeah, this will last me a long time. It did not. And, uh, now I'm sober. So anyways, 
um, 40 grand on the day I break my leg down to about 10,000 the day I get sober, six months later, 30 grand gone. Um, I spend the rest of it on going to the NLP conference. There's $5,000 to grab a plane, pay for the conference, get a hotel room, the whole deal. Took what little I had left, put it with my um, tax return, which I remember being roughly like four grand or something like that. Paired that up, put a $7,000 down on my sobriety vehicle, Sobriety Fay, the one whose engine just put it on me in hot springs recently and then i was broke so 40 grand august 13th 2016 completely broke after i buy a car sometime in may didn't take very long to blow through 40 grand and so now here i am trying to figure out a way to save up money here we go now i started really paying attention to my credit score and my finances as soon as i got sober I had let my student loans go into collections by missing a couple payments and not answering letters. That sucked. Um, I had gotten myself into an identity theft issue back in 2010 that was still haunting me, Uh, put me into the check system, which is a system the banks have when somebody has been flagged for doing um, bad, nefarious things. And even though I wasn't guilty of doing anything necessarily nefarious, I certainly had my accounts uh, screwed with, and thus I was now being punished. So for seven years, I couldn't even have a normal bank account. That collapsed my credit score. The go, <laughs> Let $40,000 in student loans go into default and watch your credit score crash by 300 points overnight. Promise you. So here we are, sober. It's May. No money in the bank account. Credit score at like 500 just completely shit show. So what I started realizing right out the gate was that I needed to figure out where I was at. I needed to figure out what my monthly financial obligations were. I needed to figure out what it was I was exactly doing. Now I'm going to jump us up a little bit because it doesn't really behoove us to go through every single step of the process over seven years as much as I think it would benefit us to realize why I have such a like high intensity focus on this right now this year. So Saved up a bunch of money with the job, but at the same time started accumulating debt because of taking all those NLP classes when I first got into this to learn public speaking, to learn neuro-linguistic programming, to become an addiction recovery coach and a life coach and all this stuff. I roughly sunk in 20 grand on day one, and I put those on credit cards and immediately was like, great, here's debt. And then I just started putting on more and more debt. As the credit score was at 500, what I've put my attention toward, and this is going to be very beneficial for those of y'all who might have a very low credit score, is you first want to figure out, is the credit score bad because you have a ton of debt on credit cards, or is it just bad because maybe you've let some things go into default? If you've let things go into default, then they're probably in collections, meaning that you can contact the collection company. And if you can't figure out who that is, get a copy of your credit report for free at freecreditreport.com. That's just a website I know about, freecreditreport.com. They might try to get you to pay for some shit, but just ignore that and just keep making sure you just get your free credit report. They might even email the damn thing now. There's Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. Those are the three credit report companies, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. And together, they each have their own credit score for you, so you're going to want to know all of them. But for the most part, they should be pretty similar. More than likely, everything that you have on your credit report is going to go across all three, but that's not always a guarantee. So you want to get a hold of those and find out if you've gotten things into default. Then you can contact the company, and in many cases, they'll let you do a massive pay down or they'll put you on a payment plan. We're talking years that some of this is going to take you, but it's better to start working on it now than just keep thinking that it's going to go away. Now, of course, you could just pull the parachute or, you know, pull the ejector on this like you were in a, you know, some sort of jet going down and just file for bankruptcy. But let's assume that you don't want to do that. And that's not what I wanted to do. So I just went in and at the time I didn't have very many credit cards, but I had enough that I was able to pull off this thing called a balance transfer. If you don't have a lot of credit cards, or even if you do, I'm just going to sort of figure out, you're all going to have to figure this out. And You can Google balance transfers and you can Google credit cards that specifically offer balance transfers when you open them. And even if your credit score is pretty low, 
um, you can generally find one that'll probably throw you five hundred to a thousand dollars, and you could get a hold of one of those credit cards, start putting enough on it that you can pay it off every month, and do that for six months, and then go ask them for an increase. And a lot of the times, you don't even have to ask a human. You can literally do that just by logging on to the credit card's website putting in your login information for your account and then just going in there and asking for an increase. And generally if it's 500, they'll double it to a thousand. If it's a thousand, they'll double it to two. Um, If it's two, sometimes it's just three. Maybe it'll go up to four grand. But as much as people will say, don't take on too many credit cards and don't get too big of credit cards, there's going to take some level of discipline here that you're going to be able to say, okay, I'm committing to doing this. I'm committing to getting my debt paid off and getting it under control. And then what I would do as I would get these credit cards and I would following this pattern, uh, right? I might get a $2,000 credit card when my credit score finally got to 640. I would balance transfer that over, filling it all the way up, which is going to mess with your credit score. But right now what we're doing is looking to pay off debt. We care less about the score and more about paying off debt. And then I would just start making the minimums on that for that year, or I would do the math. And if I owed two grand on it and I was not paying any interest, That's what a balance transfer will do. You won't have to pay any interest on it for the terms for which the offer is there. And usually it's 12, 15, or 18 months. Now you pay $50, 5% for every thousand that you send over into the balance transfer. So if you bring over two grand, then you're going to have to pay a hundred bucks for that. And if the credit card's only got $2,000 of the space on it, you really only get to bring over 1,900 and then the rest of it becomes the fee. This really actually is a very beneficial way of being able to move money around and slowly allow yourself to pay off your debt without taking on more um, interest. If your interest over the course of that term, 12, 15, or 18 months, would end up being more than the $100, right? $50 for every thousand. Then let's just go with the $2,000 credit card. Well, if you're going to pay 100 bucks to basically transfer it over, but your interest on that $2,000 was, let's say, $40 a month. Three months in, and you've already made yourself back 20 bucks by not having to pay $40 a month in interest for three months. That's 120 bucks. It costs you 100 bucks to balance transfer it. Now, I'm just telling you what I did. If you've got people out there being like, this is stupid. I don't believe what this guy's doing. I can't believe he's telling people to do this. Look, guys, there's a lot of ways to do this, but I am not putting my financial future into the hands of one of those debt consolidation companies because I do not trust their fine print. Sometimes they have um, penalties if you try to pay it off too early, or you're just literally not allowed to pay it off too early. So if your payment's $400 for 56 months, that's it. You're paying it. And you miss a payment, man, they will come and steal your children. (laughs) Not really, metaphorically, but I'm telling you, shit goes sideways real quick whenever you cross those kind of companies. So I just wanted to deal with it on my own. And balance transferring it out was what worked. So if it gives me 12 months and in the, in the $2,000 is the transfer, put 12 into 2,000. Just let me just do rough math and be incorrect here. Let's just say it's 180, right? Well, that's $180 I just set to pay every single month. And now I don't even have to think about it. 180 by the end of the term of the 12 months, I will have paid that completely off. Now, if you're going to do something like this, it's very important to make sure that if you go past the 12 months, that all the interest that had accumulated that you didn't have to pay doesn't now get dumped on the card. And most of these big credit card companies like Chase and Barclay and Discover and uh, Wells Fargo, those companies will not do that. They will not make you pay all the interest that you missed. They will just literally start charging you interest as soon as the, the offer ends. But we did buy a couch this last summer for like 3700 bucks, and we got one of those 12 months same as cash things. That's different. That company, if I don't have that all paid off by the last date, by the, by the day 366, they're going to take all the interest I would have been paying over the course of the whole year, and they're going to slap it right down on top of that credit card. And now I'm going to have to pay all that interest off. So I've been very mindful to make sure I'm making payments on this couch so that it's completely paid off by the time the year's done. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I know $3,700 sounds ridiculous for a couch. I thought so too. I'd never done anything like that, but we just bought a house and I was like, you know what? I want to do this for the family. I want to do this for myself. I've never in my life owned my own couch. All my couches were street couches or friends' couches that they were given to me because they were moving. 
And literally, like, my last three couches were street couches in Los Angeles. I know. Gross. So fuck it. Get myself a cool couch. It's awesome. I love it. I keep the damn thing so clean. (laughs) I almost want to put plastic over it. But I don't. Because, excuse me, I want to make sure that it's a cool couch. So I just keep the damn thing clean. So let's reel it in, Jess. Let's focus. See, this is what I'm talking about. There's so many different angles I can get us lost in the sauce. So I covered a little bit about the balance transfer. I'm going to make sure I do a whole episode just on credit cards. But for those of you who are interested in figuring out a way to move credit card debt, a way that I have found to be extremely beneficial, if you have credit cards that have the space, and some of us do, I mean, we're not, you know, not everybody is looking at their money thinking, my goodness, I've only got a $500 credit limit, though that was certainly where my sister found herself, very low credit cards. And we got her a credit card, 500 bucks, paid it off for six months. They gave her, it may have been 250. Then they may have doubled it to 500. Well, now it's a thousand. We got her another credit card. That one started at 500 and she's about ready to turn that one into a thousand. And she only puts a little bit on it every month, pays it off, doesn't let anything revolve. But over the la- course of the last couple years, We've been able to grow her credit score. I think last we saw, it was like in the 680s, 690s. When we started this, it was in the high 500s. And just simply with two credit cards, paying them down and getting getting more uh, of a limit built where it would double, 250 to 500, 500 to 1,000. Now she's gone up almost 100 points just on that alone. So I know a lot of people will say, don't get credit cards. It's the ruination. Well, it does take responsibility and discipline and willpower and just habituation of being mindful about your money. If you're prone to going on to Amazon at one in the morning and buying a bunch of shit you don't need, then yeah, we might want to reel that in a little bit. But if you want to be responsible and you want to build up your credit score and do good things with your finances, it's going to take some shifting of habits. So Again, I know I've covered a lot, and I'm not really sure where I'm going with this right now, but I want to reel it back into January 1st of 2024. Now, I have been moving this balance transfer thing around for years now, and because of COVID and some ebb and flows in my finances and moving out here and having to leave the serving job in LA, having a lot of expenses that I wasn't prepared for when we bought the house, um, I had gotten my debt back up to $30,000. Now, the business is doing well, but obviously uh, businesses can always be doing better. And certainly being a coach and a speaker and all that stuff, it doesn't pay horribly, but it's inconsistent. And it's not one of those surefire things where it's always there. I know you see a lot of these people on the TikTok and the YouTubes and the Facebooks and the Instagrams talking about how you can start your own business. And I promise you, you'll be making five figures because I did in less than three months. I've worked with a lot of those people in Los Angeles. I know exactly what it's like to sit around a table with all of them and discussing the reality of their situation. A lot of these people who claim those kinds of things are doing a little bit of fibbing, a little bit of white lying, in some cases just straight up making shit up. Most podcasts are only getting about $17 per 1,000 listens per download. So if you're getting 10,000 downloads for an episode, that's only 170 bucks. That's not a whole ton of money. Um, just like those YouTube people, yes, some of them can get three thousand, two, three thousand dollars for a video, but you've got to get yourself up into the hundreds of thousands, if not a million viewers, in order to bring you able to pull that in. And then you have to be able to do it consistently. And I know for some of you are thinking, yeah, but this person puts out a video every single week and they make a million views, and that's four thousand dollars. Yeah, and it's a lot of effort to put all that together. And when they start off, they might be doing it solo, but as it grows and grows, they have to start bringing in employees. So it's not just all their money. And I think it's extremely important as we start to discuss money that I throw in this little caveat that I should have probably brought up 22 minutes ago, is that most of us are in the working class. People who are in the working class should stop talking shit about other people in the working class and how much money they have or don't have. Most of us do not have a year's worth of bills saved up in the bank account to be able to pay off a year's worth of bills. If all, if my feet got eaten by a bear today, do I have a year's worth of bills money in the bank? No, I do not. Most people don't have nine months. Most people don't have six months. Most people don't have three months. When the government shut down a couple years ago, they started talking about how most United States citizens, most people in America do not 
have enough money in their bank account to cover their bills for three months. Then they started to chunk it down and realized most people don't even have enough money in their account to cover a $400 emergency bill. $400 emergency bill. If you're working for $10 an hour, that's 40-hour work week. And that's if taxes didn't exist. On $400 of pay for a work week, you're probably going to lose $50 to $60 of that just in taxes. So somebody would have to work an entire week and still not have enough money to pay an emergency bill. Most of us are falling within these parameters I just mentioned. The $400 you don't have up to not even having three months worth of bills saved up. That's where, according to statistics, like 80% of the United States lives. Yet what's really interesting is that when people start getting successful, and I've seen this happen with podcasters and my YouTuber friends, and they'll come out and be like, oh my goodness, I just made $7,000 this month. I'm so happy. Thank you, everybody, for supporting the show. It's like vitriol toward them. Like, how dare you be financially successful? Yes, you can entertain me. Dance in the streets for me, monkey. But don't make money off of this. Don't you dare all of a sudden have success while all of us are starving. And I understand how it can feel when you see other people be successful, but we're all in the working class. It's not that there's not enough money and opportunity for all of us to succeed. It's the attitudes that we have. When I see another podcaster succeed, when I hear that one of my friends sold their business for you know, multiple millions of dollars, I don't get jealous about them succeeding. I get angry at myself for not making better decisions in my 20s and 30s. Hell, I'm angry with myself about decisions I made about my business two years ago, six months ago. I don't have any energy to be jealous about somebody else's money. I only have the energy to beat myself up for not working harder for what I desire in my life. I know. Even as I said it, I know that was a stupid thing to to do to myself, but I still do. We still beat each other up. Automatic negative thoughts are a real thing. So as you start to look at your finances and your bank account and you realize that somebody else might have bigger credit cards than you or a nicer car, just realize that If you start to implement some of the things that we're going to talk about during this series, you will absolutely be able to get yourself out of this debt hole and start figuring out ways to put together a retirement account, to put together enough finances to get that car that you need to get from A to B, right? Without, you don't need an $80,000 nice car. You can go to CarMax and buy a pretty decent one for, like I did, a Hyundai Santa Fe that was a fleet vehicle, would have sold for 40 grand brand new. Two years later, it's selling for $25,000. Um, after it being a lease vehicle for two years and getting 30,000 miles on it, I sought my tax return and a little bit of money I'd saved up on the side, and I'm financing 17 grand at 3.1% interest, which came up to about, roughly about $34 a month in, in interest. And I just sat there and paid $308 every single month towards this car until the last six months when it was so much lower than I thought it was going to be that I just paid the whole damn thing off. But still, It took me some time to do that, and it built my credit score up at the same time. It takes time. Just like it took me time to get $30,000 into debt, which is what I woke up staring at on January 1st of 2024, and I'm freaking tired of it. I'm tired of moving around the thousands here to the thousands there to pay the bare minimum while I'm still scrimping and saving, trying to, you know, put some money into the house and wanting to have a savings account and wanting to have a bank account and wanting to have a retirement account. And there's all these things that I would like to have that I realize are going to set me up for success when I'm in my late fifties and my sixties and my seventies. Hoping to rely on social security in our day and age is a fool's errand. It doesn't seem like they're being very wise with the way they're distributing that. And I'm pretty sure the federal government's using it as their bank account. They're just like, oh, well, we'll take some money out of Social Security. No, dicks. We're putting that money in there. You started up this system during the New Deal. The whole idea was that we would give you money knowing that it would be there later. This isn't like some special thing. You're not. This isn't a handout. I have literally been paying money into this system since I took my first job. Stop fucking with Social Security. The whole point was it's supposed to give social, right, social security. The society is supposed to be secure. So we're not all 80 years old working at Walmart or working at a bellhop at some Asheville hotel. Literally, this dude pushing this bellhop cart was in his 80s. I'm like, frick, man, this is not where this dude should be right now. 
He should be enjoying the latter years of his life, not pushing this heavy bellhop cart. So I want to be that person who thinks ahead. So here we are, January 1st, and I'm over it. And I say, okay, if I take on a serving job and I do some quick math and roughly 25, let's just say 2,500, it's actually 2,250, 2,250 a month. And I'm like, okay, I find a servant job. I figure out what their sales are per day. I figure out what their average per person average is. And I start doing some quick math. And I'm like, if I were to put in three to four shifts here, I could, I should be able to make roughly $2,500 a month. That comes out to about, what, $625 a week. If I work three or four shifts, that means I need to average somewhere around 175 to 225 per shift. Uh, that means I probably need a four or five table section, and I need, I need my sales to roughly get to about $1,000, if not some days higher, maybe some days lower. But basically, I need 1000 bucks to make 20%. That's $200. Factor in tip out, that's 3 to 4%. Now I'm walking with 160 to 170 if I can replicate that over three shifts. Now 170 becomes 450 plus 20, 510 of over four shifts, another 170, it was like 510, what did I just say, 590, 690, right? So we're looking at like a 510 to 690 kind of window here, depending on three or four days at $170 a shift. Now, for those of you who just wonder what the fuck I did, I'm very good with numbers. I'm not good with Pythagorean's theorem and, and, and you know, uh, calculus and trigonometry and shit. I don't get any of that stuff. But I'm very good with just basic numbers. I personally think that I cared a lot about multiplication tables when I was younger, and I was really, I excelled really well with basic math, like division and multiplication, addition, subtraction, that kind of stuff. And I see it in my head, like I can build out like I can see it as if I was writing it and I've got a special way of rounding up and down and multiplying. And it's just, my brain's very quick with numbers. Um, on top of that, I dealt drugs for like 15 years. <laughs> so if you're not good with numbers and how to, and how to deal with money and you're a drug dealer, you're probably going to go sideways pretty quick. Um, but yeah, most of my twenties I dealt drugs. So I just got very quick with doing math and understanding grams and all that crap. <laughs> It just, you know, it benefits the businessman to know how to do the math that he deals with on a regular basis. So back to the point at hand, I quickly realized that if I were somewhere in that, you know, what I say, 510 to 690 range, um, right, if I was bringing in and all I needed was 625 a week. So right there, three to four shifts, if I can be averaging somewhere around that 175 to $200 range after tip out and taxes, I should roughly be able to bring in 625 a week which is roughly where I'm at. I'm actually at almost $200 a shift uh, working at this little tiny breakfast place uh, here in my town, like seven minutes up from my house, like pretty sweet considering I'm in a small town that I can be doing this well uh, with this serving job. And on top of it, the amphitheater where I went and saw Weezer and Train and Black Crows and places like that, bands like that, um, they're hiring. So I recently got a job to bartend there so that I'll be able to bring in even more money. And for those of you out there who are like, dude, I got a nine to five job. I can't pick up a side hustle like this, that, or the other. There's a lot of different ways on websites like TaskRabbit um, or Uber Eats or you know some of these different things. There's a lot of gig economy kind of work out there now. If you really want to be able to bring in an extra $500 or $1,000 a month, if you do some quick math and realize, oh, okay, well, I could go Uber Eats and you know, try it out, talk to some people who do it. Maybe they're making $100 for a five-hour shift during dinner time. You could get off work and go do a two, three, four, five-hour shift on a weekday, and maybe you bring in a couple hundred bucks. And then you got to figure your gas and your maintenance on the car. But if you start to do some quick little math, you realize there are opportunities now that did not exist 20 years ago. Shit, these didn't even exist when I had my bank account shut down. PayPal was fledgling at the time, and there certainly wasn't Chime or Cash App. I was literally without a bank account until I got hired at the SLS in Beverly Hills, and they gave me one for automatic deposits of my paychecks. Then I could at least deposit money and withdraw money from this bank, but I couldn't write checks or anything else like that. And really, the only reason I was able to even have that bank account is because it was backed by the hotel that I worked at, because I wasn't allowed to write checks or anything. I couldn't according to them, do anything nefarious. But I didn't do anything nefarious to get myself in that system to begin with. But anyways, that's a whole nother episode. So here we are, January 24th. I want to pay off $30,000 in debt. 
this is what I did. I just broke it down like I just explained it to you. And then I started going through my finances. I've got a business credit card and I've got a personal credit card. And those were that's my monthly revolvers. So I started to go through my personal and my business one and started to figure out what subscription services do I not need. I don't need Netflix and Hulu and Apple Plus and HBO and all these streaming services, you know, Paramount and Disney. I don't need to, I'm not going to be watching all of them. Your family needs to decide. Which ones do you want to have right now? Because you can get them month by month. And yes, I get you can save a little bit of money if you do some yearlies. But honestly, do the quick math. If you're going to decide that you're going to watch Disney for three months and then you're going to kick that out and go get Paramount for two months and then go get HBO for three months because the new Game of Thrones is coming out in June. You know, wait till all the Game of Thrones are completely released and then go get HBO, have it for a month. Go get Paramount for a month. Go get Disney for a month. Go get some of these, but cut them because we don't need to be dropping $100 unless you're sitting around in your underwear watching The Simpsons eating bonbons and you literally are watching 12 hours of TV a day, paying for all those services whenever all those shows that you want to see, especially their original programming, is always going to be on those apps anyways. It can wait, and you can save money that way. How often do you go to Starbucks? How often do you go out to eat? Are you monitoring how much you're spending on your groceries? Maybe you could be buying generics whenever instead of the name brand because shrinkflation's a real thing. And we're all getting screwed at the gas pump. We're getting screwed at the cash register for at the grocery stores. We're getting screwed in a lot of places where pre-COVID, these things weren't so expensive. So now things are getting more expensive while we're trying to pay down debt. It is going to absolutely benefit you for to be extremely mindful every time you pull out your credit card. But where I found myself getting screwed, and you could be having this happen to you too, is the subscription services, is the memberships, these random things on my iPhone that I subscribe to that don't you know, don't renew for a year, but you know it's like Headspace or some of these like book consolidation apps where somebody will have, take a book and then they'll consolidate it into like seven quick little sound bites so you can learn a whole book in fourteen minutes. Um, what is one of those, what is one that's on my phone currently? <laughs> Under ed, ed, Headway, Elevate. Um, that was one medium, even the medium website, the one that does blogs wants you to pay like $20 a month or like $75 for a year. There's a lot of these little subscriptions. And if you're on your phone, then you can go into uh, your iPhone and you can look at the subscriptions you have. And certainly if you think that you've got a lot of these in your credit cards, then you, what you're going to want to do is go through your 2023 statements and, and literally print them out and go through them with a different colored highlighter pen. Red, you know, red or pink for stop, just stop them all together. Yellow for not really sure and green for a must keep. And go and start looking at these ones that show up uh, every three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, because oftentimes they'll be even bigger than a monthly subscription. So now all of a sudden you're just like, la, 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 la. And then like a $200 charge shows up and getting those people to refund your money is (laughs) have fun with that. So it's better to just be able to cancel it. Like recently, I, I caught on to this one little trick where if you get like a, a free 30-day trial um, or maybe you have to pay $7 for the first 30 days, but then it goes up to like $30 after that. Well, once you've paid that $7, you're locked in for that 30 days. Literally cancel it right then and there or the very next day. And now you still got that 30 days, but you're not going to have that thing auto renew. And I even put all my credit card bills that are coming due, I put them on my Google calendar. So every month I see when these things are coming up. Special ones like the software that I put my online academy, the Wise Mind Empowerment and Leadership Academy, the one I talk about when you can join the tribe and you can take these classes. That software is almost $1,500 a year. Now, it's doing well enough that I don't need it. I don't want to cancel it because Teachable and Thinkific and all these other ones are just as expensive. But $1,500 just shows up out of nowhere on a credit card I'm not prepared for. It can be a bit of a shock. So I've got all these big yearly bills also in a spreadsheet and I put them on my calendar so I know when they're coming. And if I decide I don't want it anymore, whether it's the Experienceify or another one, I can at least stop it before it charges. See, this is key. It's not just the monthlies that can get you. It's some of these yearlies too. If you have any of those, printing up all your credit card statements and going through and looking for them, right? Because they're going to show up at different times. So if somebody's like, well, just print up your last three months and let's look at your expenditures and see which ones we can cut. 
Yes, that's going to work for McDonald's and Starbucks in the grocery store and things of that nature, but it's not going to work for these big, you know, quarterly or by, you know, by, you know, uh, six months or year long ones. It's just, you're not going to necessarily locate those. So I went through all of my expenditures on my business and on my personal account and I started cutting out all my subscriptions. I mean, literally, I just went through and cut them all. I cut every single one of them. Except for Netflix, because the family loves watching Netflix. I love that and YouTube TV. So let me reel it in. Didn't cut them all. Those were the two. Those are the two I knew I would miss immediately. I was, it was football season. I'm not going to cut my freaking YouTube TV during football season. What am I crazy? I'll pay that eighty bucks for football. Okay, so then it was that and Netflix. And then I started just slicing every other subscription for streaming services. I cut. I. I I got all my Audible books that I've been prepaying. You're only allowed six credits anyways, and I was keeping that at like four, five, six credits. I wasn't even spending it, so I just cut them all. And then I said, now wait and see which ones I all of a sudden want back. Well, I haven't used Audible in a few months because I got already a ton of Audibles. I didn't need any more of those. I haven't needed to go back to Paramount Plus. Anything I see that's coming on there, I'm like, yeah, I'll wait till later. I don't have enough time to watch TV anyways, and there's plenty of stuff on Netflix. I I added one of my friends to my YouTube TV thing. He let me have his HBO login, so I'm good there. Now I've got HBO and YouTube TV and Netflix. We're set. I bought a new iPhone last year uh, because my contract was ending with T-Mobile. They gave me Apple Plus for free for 90 days. So I set that up, and as soon as it started, that free 90 days, I went ahead and set up a calendar reminder so I would cancel it on day 89. Right, and then any other subscription services I cut, like Headway and some of these other ones that were, you know, that were enjoyable, but there were apps on my phone I was even forgetting I had. And then I figured if I ever went to go open it, first couple times I might say, Oh, okay, well, you know, what else could you do besides open up this app that might cost you sixty dollars for a whole year? But if I kept wanting it to come back, then I would let myself have it back. But here I am almost at May, and none of those things that I cut have I needed back. And see, it turns out that you think you want it until it's gone, and then you start to realize that your brain's got plenty of other crap it could be doing on the phone, plus school and everything else. So I went through all my credit card statements, and I cut out all the things that I did not need to be there. Then I started looking at my groceries, and then I start, we started doing some math, and we started realizing, okay, name brand is important when it comes to like a ranch or a barbecue sauce or a ketchup, but it's not as important when we're going for, let's say, onion rings, right? Like where could potato chips, right? Yeah, the flavor is a little bit different when it's Kroger's brand or Great Value versus Lay's or Ruffles, but overall, it's not that much difference for between paying five sixty nine for a fourteen ounce bag of chips or two dollars at Kroger for the generic sour cream and onion, right? I just save three sixty nine. I can get two bags of chips for basically the price of one. Plus I still save a dollar sixty nine. Like that's the kind of thing where we get real mindful. Get a Costco or Sam's Club membership and now all of a sudden you can buy meats in bulk and you can buy ten pounds of hamburger meat or ten pounds of turkey burger and break them off into little one pound chunks. And now you bought that for 20 bucks and you just got five pounds, that's four dollars a pound. Or you go to some of these grocery stores and they're wanting to charge you five, six, seven dollars for a pound of turkey burger. Like it that's two, three, four dollars in savings right there. It's gonna take some forethought. It's gonna take some opportunities to cut back a little bit here and there. But I'm paying down my debt and I will pay this thirty thousand dollars off by the end of the year. Now I'm just gonna turn around and keep the job to pay off the master's degree. But I figured it out, and you can figure it out too. And yeah, I know some of the, some of the tribe members. Like one drives a truck. Well, he's driving a truck. There's really no way to maximize his earning potential. And we're thinking about ways because there could be. Maybe he figures out a way to do some kind of training of other truck drivers, or maybe he figures out a way to turn his knowledge about sobriety and recovery into being a recovery coach for other truck drivers. Um, there's, you know, some people work in health clinics, and there's not really a way for them to have any more bandwidth to necessarily make any more money right now. So maybe it's just about saving money, right? It's like up to you to figure out, could you pick up a side hustle? Or is it just saving money? Or is it saving some money and a side hustle? Are there other ways that maybe you could begin to look at your finances in a different way? See, what I've noticed the more I talk with experts in this field about this is that 
most of us get locked in on, well, this is what I do for a living, and then this is how I've been making my money, and I don't want to deviate this, deviate from this because I don't want to lose my health insurance, or I may not be able to get a better job, or this is definitely stable, and I don't know if something else will. And I'm not saying that any of that stuff is true or not true. But what it's important for you to realize is something that I was told by my therapist when I first got sober. I remember looking at Melissa being like, I just don't understand what the fuck I've done with my life for the last 22 years. And she's like, Jesse, a lot of people think that when they first get sober. They they come out of this tranced out, malaise, hazy life of addiction. And what they're seeing in themselves is not a life that they thought that they would have created. They may not be happy with their house or their job or their wife or their kids. And you can't necessarily, you know, quit your job, quit your wife, quit your husband, quit your kids. But you can certainly begin to experience in them differently. And part of that process is realizing that you may not have necessarily picked a career that really is going to get you where to go. And it might mean that you go off and get a Uh, some trade skills so that you could switch careers and you could stop working in the office and maybe go work with your hands, be a plumber, a mechanic, an air conditioning repair person. I learned the other day that people who install elevators make 90 to $120,000 a year. Now, not right out the gate, but after a few years of experience, these are jobs that are, that are actually pretty easy to come by because not many people have the skills for them. There was this whole video on why college has destroyed America and how there are tons of plumbers and electricians out there. And yes, not all of them are making, you know, 70, 80, 90, a hundred thousand dollars a year. Certainly the ones that start up their own business have the greater potential to do that, but that college isn't necessarily the, the fast way to wealth in this country anymore. So you could start looking at different ways that you could maybe shift your career. I can't come up with all those scenarios right now and possibly have any of it make sense in this episode. But you got to stop saying I can't and I don't and I don't and I won't and start thinking of ways that I can and I will and I'll try. Because I'm telling you right now, whenever I started up this master's school, I thought, my goodness, this is taking up so much of my time. I don't have time for anything else. And then I decided to take on a serving job. And then I just, and then somehow more clients started coming and I doubled my client load on top of already having school, on top of giving 30 hours of my life to this restaurant. Then the Orion called and I was like, sure, I'll take that on. That's another potential 20 hours a week. But what I have found is the more full I make my life, the more I start cutting out the nonsense that wasn't really benefiting me to begin with. I'm not on social media or so, some of my inboxes on my email are out of control. I have no time to go back and delete a bunch of spam mail. I just unsubscribe and I'll just mass delete 500 emails out of this one account because I just don't even care. Don't You know what? I haven't noticed it being necessarily in my life up to this point. I got my business ones. I'm always answering that. Got my from sobriety recovery at Gmail. Definitely answering that. But I'm not wasting a lot of time cleaning out inboxes. I've had, a, I've had crap in my office I've been needing to clean for like a month now. But each day I'm just like, yeah, I'll deal with it later. Now again, how you're going to spend your time, how you're going to be able to pay off your debt, how you're going to be able to figure out how to save up for for your retirement or for a new car or for a home down payment. There's a lot of variables in that. And I will seek to help you as much as I possibly can with my experience in this as we begin to dive in deeper. And I don't know if this next one will come next week or if it'll come a little bit down the line. But as we, I've got a lot in here about what it is I think that we could do to begin to experience money differently. And while this episode has certainly gone in a lot of different directions, I didn't necessarily think that it would right now. And I did have a whole like summarization and a script and setting goals and all this other stuff. I just thought it was really good to lay down a groundwork for the fact that where you decide to put your attention toward, your focus will go, your energy will flow. If you feel like you are in a financial bind, and yes, I understand financial binds. I don't understand yours. It might be because you're on disability. It might be because you have an injury. It might be because uh, you don't have the education level in your town that where all the jobs want, right? You might need to figure out ways to flex yourself around a system that you don't really understand that well. But if you've got the desire to get yourself out of debt and to figure out different ways of doing things and you've got the means to do it, 
And, and again, there's so many hypotheticals. There's somebody out there invariably right now is like, well, if I get a side hustle job, I'll lose my benefits from the government for blah, 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 this. Okay, then I get it. Then maybe this isn't able to be utilized for you as far as a side hustle goes. But if you've got debt and you're trying to figure yourself out of this stuff, then cutting back your expenses and looking at money differently is going to benefit you. Again, there's infinite, there's tens of thousands of y'all listening to this. I cannot possibly come up with all the hypotheticals. I can just simply say that if you decide to start to make changes, changes will occur. And it will take a long time. I have been bouncing around in the 700s now for years trying to get this debt paid off. And I finally just said, you know what? If I can just pick up a side job, I will be able to pay this debt off because all the other things that I do from the coaching and the speaking and the running of the American Contingencies podcast and all you know all these other things that I'm doing, they're making me enough money to be able to cover my bills now and put a little bit into savings. But what if I took on another job or two? Yeah, one of them I'm going to have to go in at 6 o'clock and stay till midnight some nights. And then I might have to get back up the next morning at 6.30 and go into the restaurant job. I might be tired for two or three days. But in those two or three days, I could potentially make 800 or or $1,000. And that goes straight into debt, straight into paying off my student loans. The more I talk to people at meetings and other things and we start to talk about their money, the more they realize that there's a lot more opportunity than they really ever thought. They're just not ready to investigate it with that thoroughness that, let's say, a Sherlock Holmes would a crime scene. And that's what some of us could feel like our finances are at right now, like it's a crime scene. And what's really, and there's so many things interesting about money and finances and addiction, is that for so many of us, we were able to come up with three, four, five hundred plus dollars a month to go to the bar and drop eighty dollars on a bar tab, drop one hundred and twenty dollars on some blow at you know middle of the day or two in the morning. We were able to spend all that money on fast food and delivery pizzas and delivery booze. I mean, there was a period of time in Los Angeles I was spending like fifteen hundred dollars a month on my addiction. And what's so just mind-blowing is how often we found the money for the addiction, but we can't figure out the money now that we're sober to pay off our debt and get ourselves financially straightened up. It's all about what we're willing to prioritize. Yeah, an eight ball at two in the morning for $300 is way more exciting than making $300 on a Sunday afternoon and coming home and saying, okay, great, this is going straight to debt. Yeah, it's, it's gratifying to pay $300 into the debt, Right, but it's not going to be nearly as awesome as, as as doing some drugs at three in the morning. It's a shifting of our mindset. It's being able to start paying this stuff down and realizing that it's the little steps day by day. And I hope that I can bring you some guidance and some some different ways of of experiencing it. Because you can Google it, and they'll they'll say how to pay down debt. It'll be you know make you know make. $20 more than your minimum payment. Don't get too close to your credit limit. Don't take out too many credit cards. You know, go through all of your finances and what I just said and cut things out. You know, uh, make sure that you pay all of your credit cards off every single month. And yeah, I mean, that's, for some of us, that's really obvious. And for others, it's like, what? I have nobody ever told me that. So I judge not. What I seek to do is introduce something that you're like, holy damn, I never thought of it that way. And I might ramble on for 50 minutes and you might only hear two minutes of juiciness and you're like, that's it. That's what I needed to hear. But it's in that two minutes that all of this thing became valuable. Our time is worth money. Our money is worth time. Are we working to live? Are we living to work? I hope that this has brought you some level of value. And as we dive in deeper to this, whether you're thinking balance transfers, whether you're thinking about going through your credit card receipts, whether you're thinking about how you manage your cash and whether you should put that more into the bank account so that you can monitor your spending through your debit card, or you're thinking maybe you pull out the debit card too much so you only want to carry $20 in your wallet. There are solutions if you're willing to investigate, evaluate, and realize that they're happening right in front of you. Money is not evil. Money is not a bad thing. There are bad people doing evil things with money, but if only evil people have money, then who's going to do the good? Money isn't the root of all evil. People do bad things with money. People see money differently. And as people who are most more than likely, most of us are in the working class, getting upset with somebody else for being successful is rude. It's jerky and it's asinine, right? 
It's like we are the downtrodden. We are the ones who are working hard. One of my clients, he's got this security deposit thing, and they're just they're trying to screw him out of a security deposit, even though he did mostly everything right. Yeah, you know, he put some nail holes in the wall. Who doesn't put nail holes in the wall? Seriously, but five hundred dollars to fix them when they're all like tiny? Come on! But it's like it's the working class taking care of taking advantage of the working class. You've got these moving companies taking advantage of people who have to move by raking them over the coals for the fee just to get their shit in the truck. And then they're breaking crap and saying, we're going to give you a seven cents on the pound. Well, when you break a TV that's 90 inches, but it only weighs 70 pounds, giving us 20 cents a pound is like $14. It $14 isn't even buying me a freaking Big Mac meal deal anymore, let alone a new 90-inch TV, jerks. Right? It's the working class taking advantage of the working class. It's the working class getting mad at other people in the working class for doing well. Most of us don't have the four hundred dollars or the three months worth of bills saved up. We're fall we're falling somewhere within that that scale. Four hundred dollars a month or four hundred dollars for an emergency bill up to three months worth of your bills saved up. Most of us aren't living in that world. We might have a retirement account, we might be making good money, but still how much of it's coming in versus how much of it's going out. And even if you do go beyond that three month thing, if you ask yourself, if I were unable to work for three to six months, would that put me in a spot of bother? You're in the working class. And when the working class attacks the working class for being successful, it's it's like how people treated others in Los Angeles. I used to say quite frequently there that there's enough room on this planet for everyone to succeed. And if instead of holding each other back, being the crab in the bucket, trying to pull the other one back in, instead, each one of us should take our our turn at leading the, the flock of geese. You ever watch flocks of geese and they do that V thing? Well, the one in the front is the one who's expending the most energy. And once he's done, it's drafting. They do it in cycling and, and they do it in car racing. And once the one in the front has expended enough energy, the ones behind it are expending less energy because they're drafting off of his off of his wind current. That one drops back and the next duck takes over and goes first place and then they flap until they can't flap anymore and then they drop back and they get to rest, you know, gliding in on the other ducks drafting. This is how we can do it. Each one of us can take our turn pulling a little bit more of our weight and celebrating the others as they succeed. If you succeed, you could literally be able to energize your friends around you to succeed. But if your friend is succeeding, instead of celebrating that and seeking to find ways for that to motivate you to succeed, you instead try to pull them back into the bucket. You try to break their wings so they fall back to earth. That's dick move, man. And what do you think is going to happen when you go to try to succeed? Who do you think is going to support you if that's the way you've shown your support? Money is not the problem. Humans and the way we interact with one another about money is the problem. And the problem isn't really a problem. It is a solution opportunity. There are people out there being generous and it is coming back to them tenfold. And there's other people out there being hoardy and scarcity minded. And that's coming back to them as well. I would love it if I could just snap my fingers and be out of debt. But I signed those contracts. I agreed to those payments. I said, this is something I want to do. And I want to take care of this. If you're finding yourself in a similar situation, I think it'd be really cool for you to sit down with your credit cards, with the people in your house who are also establishing parts of your expenditures in your budget and discussing ways that you can start to really reel things in. And yeah, it might mean no vacation this year or the next two years, but on the other side of it, it could mean that you started a college fund or a retirement account, or you've got a more reliable car, or you figured out a way to set some money aside so you could get a down payment for a first time home buyer in the United States. There is a lot of things that you can do, but you don't know what you're capable of till you try. And you don't know where you're at until you start to dissect your finances. I will leave you on that because this has gone way too long. And I'd really like to turn back on the NFL draft. Just realize that while money might be creating stress, one of the funnest things to do is watch your money alleviate that stress by putting it towards the things that are actually causing you the stress. It's the debt. It's the uncertainty. It's the scarcity mindset. Yes, I get it. Our schedules are tight. We're all extremely busy. 
But somewhere out there in the internet world, there's an opportunity for you to make an extra 50 or $100 a week. And that may not sound like much, but $100 a week is $400 a month. And over the course of a year, that's $3,600. If I walked up to you right now and handed you $3,600, would you be able to figure out something to do with it? More than likely. So if you could be making an extra $100 a week, and I'm sorry, my math was off, that's actually, yeah, four times 12 is 4,800. But there's actually 52 weeks in a year, that would actually be 5,200. So if you could figure out a way to make just $100 a week doing something, you could make $5,200. You know, the max you can put into your Roth IRA, I think is somewhere between five and six grand a year. You could literally go off and find yourself a side hustle for $100 more a week, and you could almost max out your Roth IRA, which is money that goes in taxed so that it doesn't get taxed when it comes out. And I think every seven years it doubles. And for those of you in your 20s, that's pretty rad. For those of you in your 50s, we might have to be a little bit more aggressive. But it's all numbers. Don't let numbers scare you. Let your uncertainty and your lack of knowledge about what your numbers are adding up to be what scares you. And instead of being scared and finding that anxiety and stress to be crippling, instead use it as motivation to figure some things out. This is Adulting 101. And while a lot of us may have missed these opportunities in our youth when we were too busy partying and you know just enjoying the hell out of life, this is our chance to step into Adulting 101, maybe 201, 301, 401. My parents were hardcore when they were in their 20s. And they retired very well off in a beautiful little lake community in southeastern Oklahoma. And I'm very proud of them for that. And I realized that while they were thinking about their retirement in their 20s when they got sober, and I didn't start thinking about it till I don't know, like a year ago. What's important is that we thought about it. And I may not end up as well off as them. I might have to work a little bit longer. I might have to be a therapist a little bit later into my life. But I signed up to become a therapist thinking of my 5, 10, 15, 20-year plan. How could I establish some level of certainty in a world full of uncertainty? It's going to come off the sweat off my brow, the 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 force of my will and the muscles within me that say get up and let's get something moving we all have an equal opportunity to access the things out here that could help us it is the determination the discipline and the desire that separates those who are able to figure out ways through that anxiety and stress versus those who just sit there sinking even deeper into the muck and the mire mire of all of that stress and anxiety. I love all of you. I want all of us to succeed. I honestly believe that there's room for everybody on this planet to succeed, but no one's going to hand it to you. You can't sit on a couch and wait for it to manifest. Not knowing where you're at financially isn't helpful. It's like not locking your doors. And if you live in the country and you don't lock your doors, people are like, we don't even lock our doors in the community. That is not safety. It is an illusion of safety. Just because you get to walk out, we haven't locked our doors in years. Well, I'm really glad that nobody's come into your unlocked house in the middle of the night and stolen things from you while they were all hopped up on something. But that does not mean that you're safe because you don't lock your doors. It means that you are fooling yourself with the illusion that you're safe because you think that you can keep leaving your doors open. And that's a game of Russian roulette I'm not willing to play any more than I'm going to allow myself to stick my hand in the head in the sand and not pay attention to where I'm spending my money and how I'm directing it. Not knowing your finances is an illusion that everything is okay and it'll all work itself out. And if it would all work itself out, then a, a lot of us would be a hell of a lot better off than we are. It's going to take time and attention and focus. But I promise you, if you do these things, you start focusing in on it, change will go in a really bright direction for you. All right, my friends, inclusivity over exclusivity, the power of positive energy, release and flow. Every day is the best day of our lives when we wake up sober. Certainly, if nothing else, our bank account isn't pissed off at us. <clears throat> Another way to save money. Shout out to Sunshine and Robert. Glow on. See you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs> 